All right. Um, good morning, everyone, and hello. Uh, welcome to FuseNet's briefing on food security outlook for Sudan and South Sudan for the period of October 2023 to May 2024. My name is Emily Toronto, and I'm a se senior food security analyst based in FuseNet's Washington, D.C. office. In today's briefing, um, I'll be covering um, I'll be covering the current situation in Sudan and South Sudan, drawing primarily from our October analysis, uh, with, but with updates in November, particularly as it relates to evolution of the conflict. I'll start with present, presentation of key messages and the current situation, followed by our main assumptions for the projection period and our projected food security outcomes through May. Finally, I'll conclude with updates on some key areas of concern for each country. In Sudan, I'll talk about recent developments in Khartoum and West Darfur. And for South Sudan, I'll focus on the situation in Rukona and in the north, northern and eastern counties facing high returnee burden. For both uh, countries, though, I'd like to note that we're focusing today on these areas because of recent developments, but many, uh, many areas of concern exist in both countries with more detailed analysis available in our reports. So to situate us within a typical year per the seasonal calendar, the current period covers October and November, which in both countries is the start of the main harvesting period and is typically marked by improvement in outcomes as households replenish their own stocks and uh, market prices typically decline. In Sudan, uh, demand for agricultural labor pick typically picks up for the main harvest through January, increasing access to income for labor dependent households. Livestock typically remains in the northern areas, accessing pasture available from the recent rains, and body conditions are typically seeing improvement over the course of the rainy season, with milk remaining at peak levels. In northern and river Nile areas, planting, planting typically starts for irrigated winter wheat. In South Sudan, the harvesting uh, continues in both the northern unimodal areas and in the southern bimodal areas as the rainy season uh, draws to an end. In the north, the floodwaters typically start to recede as the dry season sets in and access to wild food and fish remains high during this period, although milk availability begins to decline with the start of the dry season in the northern areas. Looking forward through May, dry season conditions will set in across both countries. In Sudan, the main millet and sorghum harvest will conclude by January and the winter wheat harvest will occur between March and April. Pastor pastoralists will migrate further south for pasture and water. Land preparation will begin toward the end of the projection period in anticipation of the next rainy season between June and September. In South Sudan, floodwaters will continue to recede and herders will migrate uh, further from homesteads to access pastures along uh, rivers and in low-lying areas, thus marking the start of the pastoral lean season in primarily pastoral areas of Pibor and Greater Capoeta. The first rains will begin in March and April in the bimodal zones in the south and west of the country. Typically, the lean season begins to set in around May and escalates in June through September. Uh, for the key messages, we see widespread crisis IPC phase three and emergency IPC phase four outcomes expected in Sudan and South Sudan during the harvesting period. This is driven by protracted and recent impacts of conflict expected below average harvests, above average food prices and poor macroeconomic conditions. Nearly eight months of conflict in severely disrupted economic and livelihood activities, trade flows, and market functionality, particularly in urban areas that have been at the center of the conflict between the two sides. Areas of highest concern include major cities across Greater Darfur and Greater Kordofan, as well as the urban populations in Khartoum, notably in Omdurman. In El Janina of West Darfur, renewed ethnically-based atrocities, pillaging, and massive displacement in early November is resulting in high levels of emergency IPC Phase 4. South Sudan continues to face high levels of acute food insecurity despite the ongoing harvest. Emergency IPC Phase 4 is expected to persist in parts of Jangle, Unity, Upper Nile, Northern Bar Ghazal, and Eastern Equatoria. Some populations are expected to remain in catastrophe IPC Phase 5 during the projection period, particularly in areas hosting a high burden of returnees that fled Sudan and areas that face protracted impacts of conflict and prior flooding. In both conflict-affected countries, food security outcomes are expected to worsen later in the dry season as food stocks decline, prices rise, income earning op opportunities remain extremely limited, and serious challenges to humanitarian assistance persist. In South Sudan, cuts to funding mean planned food assistance will only be sufficient to reach just over 2 million people in April and May. The le levels of acute food insecurity in South Sudan remain among the highest and most severe globally. However, FuseNet assesses the risk of famine, IPC Phase 5, is low through May 2024, 
based on low likelihood that flood extent will increase and or conflict will escalate such that households will be isolated from wild foods, markets, and assistance for prolonged periods of time. So turning to uh, the current situation, conflict and its related impacts continue to be a primary driver of food insecurity in both countries. On the left, we have a map of hotspots of conflict in both countries between August and November. In Khartoum, uh, October and November, the incidence of violent, com violent conflict has seen marginally declining trend shown in the top uh, graph on the, on the upper right. However, the intensity is still high with heavy reliance on shelling and artillery fire and reports of neighborhoods under siege-like conditions, tactics that are having severe impacts on access to food and income for urban residents still located in the city. The graph on the bottom shows areas of Sudan in shades of green. Greater Darfur is the lighter green on the bottom, saw increases in early November, which capture the large-scale violence and atrocities committed in El Janina, with estimates of thousands of mass massacred. Similarly, similar ethnically based atrocities, while not reaching the same scale of El Janina, have been reported in other cities, including Zilinji and Niala. Uh, that's Zilinji's in central Darfur and Niala of south Darfur. There's also been documentation of both sides ignoring the Jeddah Declaration to allow humanitarian access to reach civilians or for, uh, to allow civilians to flee conflict areas. This has been reported in parts of Greater Darfur as civilians attempt to flee to Chad, as well as in parts of Khartoum. In South Sudan, security conditions remain tense and highly volatile in many areas of the country, with sporadic outbreaks of conflict continuing to disrupt livelihoods and displace households. In November, an increase in the no violent events uh, were recorded in Greater Bar Ghazal, as indicated with the arrow um, on the graph uh, in the shades of blue. This uh, included clashes that occurred in Abye administrative area, um, also in between rival communities in Warap and between government forces and opposition forces in Unity. The latter uh, incident in Unity resulted in flight of 700 people and deaths of several armed combatants. And it continues to highlight the concern for clashes between political opponents as they jostle for territorial control and inflame and polit politicize communal tensions. In uh, Sudan, while control of Khartoum remains heavily cont contested, RSF has continued to consolidate its control over the western half of the country. The map on the left shows RSF territorial control in yellow, SAF in red, and other militias control in shades of green. As can be seen, RSF has captured four of the five capitals of Greater Darfur, with the exception of El Fasher of North Darfur. The battle for control over many of these cities uh, came at heavy cost to civilians, with looting and destruction of public and private infrastructure, loss of property and assets, and major disruption to economic and livelihood activities, including access to cultivation and self-employment opportunities. In North Darfur, tension is increasing, with several Darfur militias announcing support for SAF or others for RSF, and it's anticipated that RSF will seek to gain control of Al Fasher with concern for the severe impacts on civilians, um, and as well as the large number of displaced who um, live in and around Al Fasher. In the midst of RSF's efforts to consolidate control, the number of actors involved uh, across the Western region has increased. As uh, the graphic on the right is, is intended to shed some light on the increase in actors involved in conflict events uh, since the start of the start of the conflict in April, with each small map showing a main actor involved and the dots color coded by the type of activity they've engaged in. On the top row, you can see SAF and RSF battles, as well as RSF and uh, SAF incidents involving other groups, um, many of which were civilian attacks. The maps on the second and third rows show other key armed groups activities. For example, on the bottom row shows increases in um, intercommunal clashes between Salamat and Beni Halba on the bottom left. And uh, um, towards the right, on uh, the bottom right, there's the um, Sudan Liberation Movement Army, which has consolidated control over parts of central Darfur, and SBLM North in the uh, parts of greater uh, Kordofan. The war in Sudan has resulted in the highest displacement globally from a single conflict. Uh, 5.34 million people are uh, so far internally displaced from their homes as of the end of November and an additional 1.4 million have been displaced to neighboring countries. The vast majority 
About 65% of total IDPs since the conflict began in April originate from Khartoum and are lo currently located in seven states in northeast and southeast areas of the country. In Greater Darfur, the displacement um, has been characterized more by uh, displacement within each state, uh, but also is likely to involve higher levels of redisplacement as this region hosted a large share of the 3.6 million protracted IDPs that were displaced from earlier conflicts. And then just a reminder that the, there's likely considerable overlap between these figures of those displaced that's been tracked since the start of the conflict in April and the protracted displace, which was last released at the end of um, 2022. Many of the displaced from West Darfur in particular have fled to Chad, which has now surpassed 450,000 Sudanese refugees. Um, around the country, most IDPs, uh, about 65%, are continuing to reside within host communities, putting immense pressure on hosting households and community resources. In South Sudan, the total number of arrivals continues to rise steeply, surpassing 430,000 people as of early December, uh, shown on the graph on the right. They're entering primarily through rank, but also through border crossings along the South Sudan's northern border, as can be seen on the map on the right, left, sorry. In addition, nearly 80,000 returnees from Ethiopia have been arriving and are staying in counties that border Ethiopia. Returnees have been encouraged to move on to final destinations and are, are arriving with little to no assets in communities that are also dealing with scarce resources and limited opportunities due to years of erosion of livelihoods and coping capacity. This high returnee burden, which I'll return to in more detail in the area of concern slide, uh, is a key driver of continued emergency and worse outcomes in the harvesting period. Turning to the main uh, crop production season, this slide provides a quick recap of June to September rainy season. Much of the area saw an early start uh, to the rains, except in pockets of southeast and northeast South Sudan, and in the south and southeast areas of Sudan. The early half of the season was characterized by average to above average rains in the west and below average rainfall in the eastern area half of the region. But as the season progressed, below average rainfall became increasingly widespread across South Sudan and parts of Southeast Sudan. In central parts of Sudan, while rainfall was cumulatively above average, as can be seen in the map in the center, it was poorly distributed both spatially and temporally, which further aggravated conflict-related disruptions to production. This can be seen also translated into the vegetative health in the map on the right um, with, at the end of September with large areas of central Sudan showing below average vegetative health as well as pockets in southeast in, of Sudan and southeast of South Sudan. To better understand what was going on in Sudan, FUSENET worked close during the, uh, for the progress of the agricultural season. Fuse Network closely with USGS science partners to zoom in on areas in the southeast, which are major producers of sorghum for the country. On the left, you have Jazeera and Rahad irrigation schemes in the Al Jazeera state. And on the right, right you have selected cropping areas of Gedaref, a major area for semi-mechanized uh, production. These maps are showing differences in vegetative health compared to past years as of mid-October, with browns and yellows showing worse vegetative health uh, and green showing better vegetative health compared to the past year. According to this analysis, so we estimated about one third of cultivated area in Al Jazeera schemes had worse vegetative health than last year by the middle of the season, with some areas of Gedaref showing up to 50% of localities had significantly lower vegetative health. Building off this analysis of vegetative health and incorporating analytical tools used to assess change in the extent of cropping areas, of cropped areas. Partners from NASA Harvest and Arizona State University working together with FUSENET and USGS confirmed high levels of reduction in cultivated extent, that is the cropped area, in these two administrative areas of Gedaref and Al Jazeera, with the largest reduction in northern areas closest to Khartoum. In Gedaref, the reduction in cultivated area overall compared to last year is estimated to be down 25%, uh, roughly 25%, which translates to about 1 million less hectares of cropped area compared to last year, year. While in Al Jazeera, the reduction compared to last year was estimated at 36%, but given the smaller size, it translates to a reduction in cropped area of about 425,000 hectares. Um, 
across much of the traditional rain fed sector spanning uh, from White Nile across through greater Darfur, available field information suggested that the season has similar has been impacted by the conflict, particularly in areas proximate to heavy fighting at different times during the season. So whether that was during the cultivation period or the harvest period. Uh, similar analysis of change in cropped areas in sentinel uh, sites of Greater Darfur is currently underway with results expected for our December update. However, overall, based on this analysis, FuseNet expects the harvests will be below last year and below the five-year average for Sudan. In South Sudan, persistently below average rainfall throughout the season deepened deficits in rainfall in the southeast with water levels falling below required amounts for water uh, for crop production as shown in the map on the left and led to crop failure in parts of Lafan of eastern Equatoria. On the other hand the below average rainfall this year led to less flooding as can be seen in the map on the center which shows the change in flood extent compared to 2022 with red areas uh, of the area flooded in 2023 alone. Purple areas showing areas that were flooded in both 2022 and 2023, and green showing areas flooded in 2022, uh, but not in 2023. This reduction in flood extent improved access to land for many. According to WFP's food security survey conducted in August, uh, July and August, improvement in the proportion of total households that planted was seen across parts of greater Upper Nile region as shown in the map on the right. Overall harvests in South Sudan are expected to be similar to or slightly below average, but with some localized areas experiencing significantly below average harvests. Overall, it's important to remember that much of South Sudan is deficit producing areas and harvests typically only last for a few months at best for many households. With the strong El Nino conditions prevailing in East Africa during October and November, above average rainfall has been observed over both countries, particularly South Sudan as can be seen on the map on the left, but it did not reach extent seen over the horn. The above average conditions expected to have improved pasture and water availability, leading to better livestock body conditions and improvements in milk production for those with access to livestock. However, parts of South Sudan, the above average rainfall has contributed to reports of flooding in several counties in November, including Bor South, parts of Juba, Maban of Upper Nile, parts of Lake and Pibor that temporarily, temporarily displaced households and disrupted trade flow and market functionality. Turning to economic conditions, uh, the macroeconomic uh, economic conditions um, continue to deteriorate in both countries in October and November. In Sudan, the exchange rate deteriorated considerably in October with a widening gap between official and parallel markets. Since April, the parallel market has decreased by 42%, uh, from 550 to 950 Sudanese pounds to the US dollar. This deterioration is driven by increased demand for foreign currencies, particularly US dollars, amid an increasing unregulated, unregulated exchange market. Trade flows remain severely disrupted, particularly from east to west and in and out of Khartoum, which is reflected in ret high retail costs of sorghum. While prices remained relatively stable through the lean season in the northeast, Reflective of a backup of supply in the eastern part as trade to the west was severely disrupted. Prices across the center and west were significantly higher in September when compared to before the war in March, uh, as well as in Omdurman uh, in Khartoum, given the scale of disruption in the city. Looking at terms of trade, which indicates the quantity of sorghum that households can buy with either a day's labor wage or a sale of a medium-sized goat, the labor terms of trade uh, in El Gedaref and Kasala remain atypically stable in September 2023 due to atypically stable sorghum prices and wage rates. However, the movement of um, agricultural laborers has been disrupted for uh, by the conflict, reducing household access to this income source. Additionally, wages are low due to reduced demand given lower cultivated area and below average harvests. In El Obey, the goat to sorghum terms of trade saw a sharp deterioration since the outbreak of conflict due to disruption in the livestock markets and rising sorghum prices. While the trend reversed slightly in September in El Obeid market due to increases in goat prices, overall the goat to sorghum terms of trade have declined by um, nearly 50% from March to September. And all monitored terms of trade remain below levels seen in early 2022. In South Sudan, the exchange rate has similarly continued to deteriorate 
driving high import costs and commodity prices across the country, which is particularly important for this deficit producing uh, country. As of the end of October 2023, the South Sudanese pound was trading at over 1,000 per US dollar on both the parallel and official markets, reflecting a deterioration of 70 to 80% of its value since the same time last year. Trade flows remain disrupted, also affecting prices of imported commodities in the North imports uh, for, from Sudan remain low amid the conflict, while regional imports, particularly from Uganda, did increase compared to last quarter, but remain lower than last year, contributing to high, higher retail prices in South Sudan. Prices started to show some decline given the arrival of harvest, as seen in the graph on the right, but remain significantly above last year and two years ago. Moreover, purchasing power remains very weak in much of South Sudan, given the poor macroeconomic conditions, extremely limited economic opportunities for households, and sustained very high prices. Disease outbreaks have increasingly reported at alarming levels in Sudan, given high displacement and deterioration in wash conditions. As of late November, the number of suspected cases of cholera surpassed 5,000, with the majority in Gedaref and Al Jazeera. There's limited data on uh, incidents of acute malnutrition, but it's expected to be worsening. UNICEF reported large increases in emissions of severe acute malnutrition in areas that are receiving high number of IDPs when compared to the same time last year. In September, UNICEF estimated that 3.4 million children under five years old are acutely malnutrition, uh, malnourished, of which 700,000 were likely severely malnourished. In South Sudan, measles outbreaks spiked following the outbreak of conflict in Sudan, given the major influx of returnees, as can be seen on the graph on the um, right. This was expected to have aggravated poor food consumption patterns and poor sanitation con conditions during the lean season and contributed to very high to extremely high levels of acute malnutrition in several counties in July and August. In Rubkona, for example, the rate of acute malnutrition was estimated at 28% in the lean season. The ongoing measles vaccination campaigns have managed to control any new outbreaks with nearly 700,000 children vaccinated to date, but the risk remains high, particularly as returnees continue to arrive in South Sudan. Humanitarians continue to deliver assistance in extremely dangerous conditions in Sudan. According to the latest release from WFP in early December, the agency has reached 4.8 million people since the resumption of programs in May with food aid, cash transfers, and nutritional assistance. Um, at present, it's difficult to determine um, what proportion of these beneficiaries received in-kind food assistance. However, in November, 1.8 million were reached total, um, of which nearly 100,000 were in West Darfur, Central Darfur, and Omdurman, uh, respectively, with this being the first delivery in Omdurman in three months, given the difficulties in access. Cash assistance has been... is. Um, they're working to expand with 90,000 having been reached in November. However, significant obstacles remain, particularly for the delivery of in-kind food assistance, including threats, roadblocks, politicization, financial exploitation, increased checkpoints and bureaucratic hurdles. Insecurity and poor road condi conditions um, continue to cause prolonged delays in deliveries and looting of warehouses and convoys continues. In South Sudan, the lean season response was con concluded by end of October in the majority of places. This included the completion of any delayed distributions due to access constraints during the peak lean season. In previous years, assistance continued in many areas with high levels of food insecurity uh, through the start of the dry season, um, as highlighted in the box for September and October uh, 2021 and 2022. While lower than the lean season, it did uh, continue in many places. However, this year, the conclusion of the lean season assist assistance was more definitive in many places, taking households by surprise, such as the case in Rubkona in August. And I will go into um, more detail on this in the area of concern section. However, this more definitive uh, conclusion of the assistance for the lean season response was largely driven by significant funding cuts. Assistance was continued in Kibor, and a new pipeline for assistance for returnees was initiated in November for returnees at final destination, with populations receiving uh, three months of assistance at 50% rations. All right, so turning to our assumptions for the projection period. Um, 
In Sudan, fighting is expected to continue uh, through the projection period. Uh, it's likely to have decreasing intensity in Khartoum towards the end of the year while increasing in Greater Darfur uh, and Greater Kordofan. RSF is likely to increase its de facto control over critical portions of Khartoum while SAF retains strong positions in Omdurman. In Greater Darfur and Greater Kordofan, tribal and ethnic tensions are likely to significantly escalate and continue through the entire projection period with ethnic militias and other groups seizing the opportunity in the increasing security vacuum to strengthen their power bases, gain control over resources, or attack perceived enemies. Tribal and ethnic tensions expected to escalate, uh, it especially exacerbated by the retaliatory and cyclical nature of attacks. Overall, peace efforts are likely to continue stalling despite efforts at regional and international uh, attempts to revive negotiations. In South Sudan, political tension between government and opposition forces are likely to remain tense amid preparations for planned elections in December 2024. Localized and sporadic clashes are expected to continue and displace households, uh, disrupt market and trade, as well as humanitarian assistance. Of particular concern remain areas of northern Jangle, Upper Nile border region, Abye and Warap, and parts of Unity and Central and Equatoria uh, states, which are likely to remain conflict and violent hotspots during the projection period. Returnees fleeing Sudan are expected to continue to increase, putting pressure on host communities. In terms of crop and livestock production, the 2023 harvest is expected to be below average in Sudan, though will vary between areas. The disruption in access to finance and inputs are expected to extend to the winter wheat cultivation in northern and river Nile areas, with harvests similarly expected to be below average. Livestock migration is expected to be constrained by conflict, likely resulting in overgrazing in the summer season grazing areas. Uh, the 2023 harvest in South Sudan, the harvest is expected to be similar to or below last year and the long-term average, though will vary between areas. Livestock production will be moderate to good in the immediate months following the rainy season, which will support improved access to livestock products and related income for those owning livestock. But during the dry season from January through May, livestock will migrate to seasonal pastures and access to livestock products will seasonally decline. In terms of economic assumptions, uh, in Sudan, the continued disruption to the business operating environment, trade flows, banking systems, and household incomes will exacerbate economic contraction. The exchange rate is expected to continue to depreciate, and stable grain prices are expected to remain atypically elevated during harvesting and post-harvesting periods, anticipated to be 50 to 100 percent above last year, and significantly above the five-year average. In South Sudan, investment is likely to further slow down amid election fears. Um, and in addition, diminished humanitarian funding, reduced hard currency inflows, and increased government spending on election-related expenses are likely to further aggravate poor economic conditions for households. The exchange rate is also expected to continue to depreciate, and food prices are expected to seasonally decline with the arrival of harvest before increasing again in February through May in advance of the lean season. In terms of humanitarian assistance, our assumptions are that in Sudan, challenges to delivery of assistance will continue amid precarious security conditions, significant looting, loss of assets, and increasing costs, uh, as well as destruction of facilities. Sustained access was most likely to be maintained in parts of government-controlled eastern Sudan, including uh, Gedaref, Al Jazeera, Kasala, and White Now. In South Sudan, WFP expects to scale down its operations in 2024 due to funding shortfalls, likely targeting a total of 2.9 million beneficiaries monthly with in-kind and cash-based assistance under both food and nutrition programs, compared to 5.4 million people in 2023. This is a 46% reduction in beneficiaries. The emergency food assistance lean season response, inclusive of GFD and food for assets programs, is expected to start in some areas in February and March. And distribution levels are expected to gradually scale up from February, March through May, but delivery will be periodically disrupted by conflict and insecurity in line with past trends. Due to these funding restrictions, WFP will prioritize the delivery of food assistance during the lean season to areas classified in emergency or worse, and areas hosting high influx of South Sudanese returnees. Uh, so here we have the projected food food security outcomes from October to January on the left and from February to May on the right. 
In both countries from October to January, we accept, expect to see widespread crisis IBC phase three outcomes sustained in the harvesting period due to below average harf harvests, high burden of displacement and returnees, high food prices and poor income earning opportunities. In Sudan, I emergency IPC phase four outcomes are expected in major urban localities throughout greater Darfur and greater Kordofan, including El Janina, Niala, Zilinji, and El Obeid, given conflict impacts on typical um, income sources, disruption to trade flows and sustained high food prices, uh, and as well as in El Fasher, sorry. In Omdurman, we assess the area to be in uh, Omdurman of Khartoum. We assess the area to be in emergency due to high levels of conflict and are closely monitoring the situation due to developments, developments that I will uh, go into in the area of concern section. In South Sudan, emergency outcomes are expected in much of Jungle, parts of Upper Nile, Unity, Northern Bargazal, Warap, and Eastern Equatoria. This is due to protracted impacts of conflict and flooding over the years that have led to low asset, asset ownership and limited income opportunities, income earning opportunities, and exacerbated in many areas by the high returnee burden. Some households are expected to be in catastrophe in Rabkona of Unity and Nairal and Duke of Lower Jongle, as well as among returnees from Sudan. In February to May, conditions are expected to deteriorate in advance of an early start to the lean season as stocks deplete prices rise and income opportunities remain limited to extremely limited. In Sudan, emergency outcomes are expected to increase across areas in greater Darfur and greater Kordofan, as well as in parts of in some parts of the eastern half of the country. In Khartoum, anticipated declining intensity of conflict is expected to facilitate greater household mobility and ability to access uh, food and income. Although proportions of households in emergency IPC phase four is expected to remain high across all localities of Khartoum. In South Sudan, much of the Eastern and Northern parts of the country are expected to face emergency IPC phase four outcomes with severe outcomes among returnees and, and emerging in Pibor and Wheel East of Northern Barakzal. However, humanitarian assistance is expected to restart, restart in February and March in certain areas um, and likely to mitigate more severe outcomes in an estimated 12 counties through May, as indicated by the exclamation point. While the severity of food security conditions in South Sudan is expected to remain severe through the projection period, FUSNET assesses the likelihood of a scenario in which famine emergence is comparably low. A low average rainfall has resulted in considerably lower flood extent in late 2023 compared to late uh, 2021 and late 2022. Meanwhile, a relatively lower incident of violent conflict has permitted increased physical access to food sources relative, uh, compared to recent years, and this is expected to continue in the medium term. Conflict in South Sudan remains highly volatile given its underlying politicized and retaliatory nature and sporadic incidences of Intercommunal attacks will continue in some areas and increase in others through the, throughout the outlook period. However, the analysis of current conflict dynamics points to a continued fragmentation of the opposition, such that likelihood of these conflicts escalating in a coordinated or widespread manner for a sustained period to isolate households from food sources, including food assistance for a prolonged period, is low. Turning now to some areas of concern. I'll start with um, Sudan with updates on Khartoum and Darfur. In Khartoum, there's been an overall trend of declining violent events since peaks in August and September, but with a shift towards tactics with severe that have severe consequences for a remaining urban population, particularly in the more densely populated areas of Omdurman. So we see an increase, as can be seen in the graph on the left, we do see an increase in the um, shelling and artillery fire. Uh, and we've had reports of siege-like conditions emerging in some neighborhoods of Omdurman, particularly along the banks with white uh, the Nile River. For example, in Al Fatihab, which is uh, indicated with the star, blue star on the map. The, the increased presence of RSF troops and targeting of civilians is greatly restricting civilian uh, movement, leading to food shortages. In addition, the Shambat Bridge connecting Omdurman to downtown Khartoum was destroyed on November 11th. And further south, the bridge with, between Omdurman uh, in far south and Jebel Aulia, Aulia um, was bombed on November 18th, further impeding movement of people and goods. 
In other areas of Underman, FuseNet's information does reveal that smaller markets are continuing to operate, although with supply shortages and high prices. FuseNet's uh, key informant information and media reporting also point to heavy population reliance on community sharing of food and reliance on remittances. In terms of assistance, WFP's report from December, early December, um, confirmed reaching over 100,000 people in the outskirts of Omdurman and Althawa, which is between Omdurman and Karari in the north of the uh, area on November 21st. However, the intensification of clashes across Khartoum have greatly affected the ability uh, to deliver assistance regularly or at the levels needed. Given the agency's severe challenges that I've mentioned earlier in terms of access to many places, WFP is increasingly looking to expand its cash-based assistance. It's completed the assessments of key markets in hard-to-reach areas of Khartoum and West Darfur and is in the process of procuring contracts for provision of value vouchers and mobile money transfers to be implemented in Khartoum and West Darfur in order to expand coverage of this cash-based assistance. As of October, FuseNet updated its analysis to assess emergency IPC phase four in Omdurman, and uh, but we continue to closely monitor the potential for worse outcomes among households in besieged neighborhoods, and we'll be updating our analysis of these areas in December in the in our December update. Turning to West Star 4, conflict incidents recently spiked again in early November in El Janina after a period of relative calm in, uh, since August. Grave atrocities have been confirmed as RSF continues to consolidate control over the area and definitively took control of the city with remaining SAF uh, soldiers fleeing. There's reports that the RSF and allied Arab militias killed thousands of ethnic Masalit civilians, which is the second reported massacre with the first occurring in June and this one now in early November. Estimates of 1,300 people were killed with up to 2,000 or more wounded according to news sources. There was targeting of tribal leaders and their families in camps in Ardamata and Dorti, just outside El Janina. Many of those killed were young Masleet men and relatives of Sudanese soldiers remaining in Ardamata after the troops fled the town. There's been reports also of sexual assault of Masleet women and taking of children uh, by detained by RSF. The attacks have led to massive displacement from El Janina, with key informant information that the city is fairly uh, all but empty with many residents fleeing to Chad or within West Darfur. Indeed, most of those who fled to uh, other parts of Darfur, whether central, south or north Darfur, as can be seen on the, in the graph on the right, have remained relatively stable. They, those uh, departures were earlier in the conflict and that much of the recent uh, displacement has been within West Darfur. At least 8,000 were reported to flee to neighboring Chad during these November attacks, although UNHCR admits this is likely an underestimation given the huge challenges of reg registering new arrivals. According to some news um, reports, the there's figures are put upwards of 20,000 people, and it's estimated to be one of the largest mass movements of new arrivals across the border since the conflict began. In terms of assistance in this area, WFP's latest report confirmed that um, two convoys went to West and Central Darfur in November, reaching 95,000 individuals in parts of Karanik locality near Janina. And we think the second one reached over 100,000 in Central Darfur, although it's not, um, we're verifying exactly where this, this convoy went. In total, since the outbreak of the conflict, WFP has reached 360,000 IDPs and, and residents in West Darfur. According to WFP, they also undertook an um, assessment of the uh, markets in, in Ardamata and El Janina and, and saw a significant increase in the number of traders and goods for sale. However, it's unclear at what point relative to this, uh, the atrocities this uh, assessment was undertaken and also whether this was now mainly people who, who remain in the city are those who are not of the targeted population. The situation remains, um, uh, for those who remain in West Darfur, they are relying heavily on sharing among host communities and putting a huge burden on food stocks in host uh, households. Emergency outcomes are expected to be widespread with households likely in catastrophe at the start of the lean season. The situation remains dynamic though, and it'll be important to uh, 
Stay tuned to our monthly reporting updates, including the December FSOU upcoming. Uh, so next I'll turn to South Sudan. Um, as mentioned at the start, South Sudan remains one of the countries with the, high, with the highest and most severe levels of acute food insecurity globally. As such, there are often many areas of high concern driven by a complex set of factors. So in this briefing, I'll provide an update on Robkona and northern and eastern Sudan um, and parts of northern and eastern Sudan that are experiencing high burden of returnees, um, given assessments that there's like households likely in catastrophe. Although I'll note there's other areas that remain of high concern. As a quick background on Robkona of Unity, the area remains heavily inundated with five out of eight piams underwater for several consecutive years now. It's, uh, it is host to a large number of previously flood displaced populations who are heavily dependent on wild foods such as wild water lilies and fish, as well as humanitarian assistance for food um, and income. They have low coping capacity and limited livelihood opportunities. With the outbreak of conflict in Sudan, this area has started to receive high numbers of returnees. The influx of returnees and poor sanitation conditions contribute to an outbreak of measles, which uh, and to a rise in acute malnutrition to up to 28% at the peak of the lean season. At the same time, at the end of August, lean season food assistance ended atypically early in Ropcona due to funding shortages, leaving households to rely increasingly on markets, wild foods, fish, uh, and fish while facing limited income opportunities and high prices. According to WFP's food security survey in July and August, population in, Rup in Rupcona did not report um, high levels of severe hunger at the peak of the lean season, likely due to the assistance and access to uh, wild foods. Um, uh, and we're not seeing at the same levels as in other localities. While fishing and gathering of wild foods is time intensive and physically challenging, these sources nonetheless remain available and accessible. In this same survey, nearly one third of the households reported that their level of dependence on wild foods was normal for the lean season, while about 15% said that it was less normal, indicative of room for expandability in wild food access, especially in comparison to other areas of high concern where wild food consumption is already being maximized. Nonetheless, the removal of food aid cannot fully compensate, cannot be fully compensated by other uh, sources of food when they remain in, inadequate. Um, and so some households were expected to be in catastrophe IPC phase five before the resumption of planned assistance in November. These were plans that were shared at the um, IPC workshop in September. The restart of assistance was confirmed uh, in November by WFP with a first round of 50, over 57,000 people reached with double distributions in November out of a plan of um, 190,000 people. And this is likely helping to mitigate some catastrophic uh, IPC phase five outcomes. In addition to the resumption of assistance, a multi-sectoral response should be sustained in this area, uh, given that the area remains in emergency IPC phase four through the projection period. And um, it's important that close surveillance continue for renewed outbreaks of measles. Vaccination should be continued with particular attention of new arrivals and provision of wash and health services should be sustained to reduce the very high levels of acute malnutrition. Finally, turning to our second population of concern, um, the returnees and host populations across northern and eastern counties of South Sudan. As mentioned earlier, the rate of uh, returning influx has been steep in South Sudan. On average, uh, 1,800 new arrivals have been uh, entering per day, totaling now over 430,000 returnees. Returning households are arriving with few of any assets, limited livelihood op options, and low coping capacity. They've been encouraged to move from point of entry to final destination in order to avoid establishment of displacement camps and have been provided with emergency rations in the form of hot meals and nutrition biscuits at entry points, as well as support in securing transportation from point of arrival. But many of the returnees have been stuck in the transit process with uh, available nutrition assessments showing uh, it from the lean season, showing elevated levels of acute malnutrition in these transit sites and deterring, deteriorating conditions along riverine transportation routes. This was further captured in high levels of disease uh, including measles, as mentioned earlier, and exemplified in Ribcona, but also occurring elsewhere. Returnees then arrived in local communities, many during the lean season, uh, facing very high barriers to accessing food and income. 
and contributing to rising pressure on host communities already struggling to share limited resources. Many of these communities in Eastern and Northern Sudan, South Sudan have low and declining asset ownership, including of livestock and crop production is marginal. Results of WFP assessment in July indicated high levels of hunger among households hosting returnees during the peak of the lean season. This added returnee burden is uh, aggravating already limited coping capacity and leading to persistence of emergency IPC phase four and worse outcomes in the harvesting period in many areas of North and East um, South Sudan. It's expected that conditions would remain severe in many areas hosting high burden of returnees given that community sharing will remain a major source of food access for returnees through the projection period, although in addition to some labor opportunities and access to wild foods. Assistance is being scaled up by WFP uh, at arrival during transit and at the final destinations. As of November, WFP has assisted over um, 370,000 people upon arrival. Uh, and WFP has also reached 125,000 returnees at their final destination with two to three month food assistance uh, deliveries at 50% rations. This assistance is likely um, helping to mitigate some of the worst outcomes among returnee populations. However, it's expected that among returnees, those with limited social connections and limited assets will continue to face uh, catastrophe IPC phase five through the projection period. Um, with that, I will conclude the briefing and I'm happy to take any questions.